All right, guys, welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Simona. I'm a master's student in chemistry. I thought in my first video, I would go over electronegativity, resonance, and some basic nucleophile electrophile reactions considering resonance. What exactly is electronegativity? And who's electronegative? What atoms are electronegative? Well, atoms that are across and up the periodic table are the most electronegative. What this means is that they are the thieves of electrons. If they are near any atom, they are going to take electrons electrons from that atom because they want them. They love electrons. It's like a kid in a candy store. The kid is going to go in the store and it's going to steal as much candy as it can. Well, not steal, maybe ask its parent to buy it. You get what I mean. But that's just like electronegative atoms. For example, if we have a bromine nearby a carbon. Bromine is more electronegative than a carbon. It is going to steal electrons from it. That is why we represent via a dipole arrow pointing towards the bromine, which is the more electronegative atom, where it is denoted as a delta minus electronegative and the carbon is denoted as delta plus electropositive because it loses the electrons to the bromine that steals it from it. And also consider a uh, carbonyl carbon. This is a ketone. The oxygen is more electronegative than the carbon. It will pull electrons towards itself and the carbon will be electropositive, losing electrons to the nearby oxygen that is more electronegative than it. We look at a carbon-carbon bond. Well, there's no dipole because carbon does not have a different electronegativity than carbon. So hence, they equally share these electrons. The electron cloud is going to be equally distributed between both of the carbons. Hence, there's going to be no dipole and neither of these atoms is more electronegative than the other one. So the next thing I want to talk about is resonance structures. We'll go over this compound and we're going to draw some of its resonance structures and then look at which resonance structure is the best, which one's the worst, and why. Before I can get into resonance, I must talk about pi bonds and the Cartesian plane. This is going to be a very simple explanation and this is just a theoretical situation, okay, for me to help you understand what is going on. So if you have two carbons that want to make a bond, what do they have to do? Well, they have to overlap. What does that mean in organic chemistry terms? Well, they have to overlap their electron density directly. That's a sigma bond. So if we have carbon-carbon and they wanna make a sigma bond, well, that's the direct overlap of electron density on the bond axis. So they're gonna hold hands. You can think of this as two people physically holding hands. But now if two atoms want to make a second bond, a pi bond, if you consider the Cartesian plane where the X, Y, and Z are all parking stalls, parking stall X is now occupied. So to make a second bond, it needs to now park in either the Z or the Y axis. What if it parked in the Z? Parks there, well then, then we go to pi bond. Now these orbitals, this electron density is not touching. The electron density on C2 and C1 represented in purple, the pi bond, is not touching, hence it's not directly overlapping. It's actually perpendicular to the bond plane. This means that it is weaker. That's what you gotta know right now. It is not like a handshake. It is like a wave at an acquaintance from 100 meters away. That is what a pi bond is. So what have we established? We have established that pi bonds are reactive. So let's do a simple resonance example with a pi bond just to show that pi bonds are weak and how they can move. So if we have this regular structure, carbon one and carbon two, and each bond where a bond is the sharing of electrons between two atoms where each atom contributes one electron, we draw in two electrons in a bond then. What if we broke this bond and we put those electrons onto carbon two? What happens? Well, carbon two gains two electrons. It becomes minus. That means carbon one, well, it loses an electron because it initially was contributing one electron to that pi bond, but now that electron is on carbon number two. So it becomes positive. Lose electrons become cationic. Gain electrons become negative. What if we did the opposite? What if we said, oh, what if carbon one gained those two electrons? Now we have flown the electrons towards carbon number one. So if you gain electrons, hence the arrowhead is pointed at you, you become minus. Carbon one is now minus. If the arrowhead is pointed away from you, it's flowing down the river in the opposite direction, you become positive. What have we established now? Well, if we have a pi bond and it flips up, if we have carbon one and carbon two, or atom one and atom two, towards atom number two. Atom number two will become minus, atom number one will become positive, and vice versa. So going back to the original structure that I said I would discuss via what are its resonance forms? Well, we just learned that a pi bond in between two atoms can flick up onto either of those atoms. So let's do that. What if, step one, draw in the electrons in each pi bond. So two electrons in each pi bond. 
And I'm going to label the atoms C1, C2, C3, and then we have this oxygen. And draw on the oxygen's lone pairs. So if we say that these two electrons in between carbon 3 and the oxygen flick up onto the oxygen, what happens? Well, the oxygen gains electrons, becomes negative, carbon 3, loses electrons, become positive. So draw in everything in black that originally was there that did not move. We did not move any of this. What we did move was we put these two electrons that were initially in the pi bond onto that oxygen. Gain electrons become negative. The arrowhead is pointed at the oxygen. Carbon 3 lost an electron. It lost this electron that initially was sharing in the pi bond with the oxygen. So it becomes cationic. So then what happens here? Well, these two electrons, carbon 2, sees carbon number 3. And carbon number 3 is like, help, help, help. I'm positively charged. I don't want to be positive. I want to be neutral. So carbon number 2 says, oh, well, I got a pi bond um, with carbon number 1. We, we can give you an electron. So we can go two in, in between carbon 2 and carbon 3. So then what happens is carbon number 1 becomes positive. The oxygen stays negatively charged. And we now have a pi bond in between carbon 2 and carbon number 3. So what have we established overall? that the arrowhead, if it moves directly up onto an atom, that atom becomes negatively charged and it gains a lone pair. If bond is moved in between two atoms, so carbon two and carbon three, then we gain a bond. Then we gain a bond. Now this resonance structure is quite stable. Why? Well, ideally we don't want any charges at all. So the original structure would be the most stable when we don't have any resonance form at all. But if we had to make a resonance form, the most stable one would be the one where the negative charge resides on the most electronegative thief of the electrons, hence the oxygen. So technically, we could do the opposite. We could say, what if, what if this pi bond between the oxygen and C3 went two over and the electrons between C2 and C1 went two up onto the carbon number one? Okay, so draw everything that did not change. So the oxygen is still there with two of its electrons. Carbon 3 and carbon 2, well, the arrowhead is pointed in between them, so a new bond forms. And then an arrowhead is pointed on top of carbon number 1, so hence it gains a set of electrons. So it becomes minus, and the atom at the start of the chain, where the electrons flowed away from it, becomes positively charged. This structure is very, very, very unstable. Why? Because we have a negative charge on a carbon who's not electronegative. It does not want to be negative. It is not electronegative. Whereas this oxygen it is electronegative, hence it does not want to have a positive charge. It wants to have a minus charge or be neutral. Next concept, opposites attract. What does this mean? Well, this means if you have some nucleophile that's negatively charged, I will make a whole other video going over nucleophiles and electrophiles. But for now, just consider that it's something. It could be a compound, an atom that has a negative charge localized on it. It likes positive charges. So for example, if this nucleophile seen this compound, what would happen? Well, first you must always consider resonance. So what was the most likely resonance form? Well, it was when the electrons moved towards the oxygen because oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. So we had O minus double bond, positive charge. So what this means is that the nucleophile not only sees the first structure, but it also sees its resonance structure. And since opposites attract, that means that this negative charge is going to be attracted to that positive charge. So when this nucleophile sees this structure, it actually sees a delta plus, delta minus. So it will attack the plus, two in, two over, two up. Label all your carbons, C1, C2, C3. An arrow was drawn towards carbon one, hence a bond was made between the nucleophile and carbon number one. And carbon number one is still bonded to carbon number two, which is still bonded to carbon number three. And carbon number three is still bonded to an oxygen two and carbon three, and a negative charge now resides on the oxygen. I will go over what happens after this in a separate video, but for now, I just wanted to do basic electron pushing and considering resonance and the fact that opposites attract. I hope that this video helped. Let me know if you have any specific questions and please leave a like, a comment, and uh, subscribe to my channel if you want to continue watching my organic chemistry content. Have a great night.